the biodiversity loss. Uh, so this question, what is G, starts to really get into these different layers of values of biodiversity and different ethical questions. And the basic model of weak sustainability, uh, you sustain the growth rate of the market economy. This is what's meant by sustainability. And to do that, you have to sustain the capital base. It's like if you live off your income from money in the bank, you don't draw down the principal. Uh, so you, you have to sustain the capital stock used to produce goods and services. Uh, these are natural capital, manufacturing capital, uh, and human capital. Okay, strong sustainability, this takes it, it's not as well defined, it's a little bit more vague, but strong sustainability, you sustain the Earth's life support systems, those life support uh, systems necessary for human well-being. Uh, it's still human economy centered and not so well defined. Ecological sustainability occurs when the human activities in balance with uh, the Earth's biophysical cycles, it's actually climate change and biodiversity. Three minutes. Uh, okay, moving right along here. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll skip that. This is interesting. I, in the, the uh, team report, I was working with uh, Carl Gore and Mailer, which was a, a hardcore neoclassical economist. But it turns out that in his analysis using standard Belarusian economics, he comes to the same conclusion. Uh, in a, a steady state model, uh, the term G is equal to the growth of total factor of productivity. And uh, his studies and studies he referred to find that G is negative because of the drawdown of natural capital. We've grown in the past because of the drawdown of natural capital. We owe it to future generations to replace the, you know, the, the capital base that we've destroyed. This gives you a negative discount rate, meaning which made sacrifices for uh, future generations. Okay, so the evolutionary basis for human uh, decision making. So, uh, go fast. So uh, there seems to be an evolutionary basis for hyperbolic uh, discounting. There's a, a French anthropologist called Heike who did a, a study of a, a group in the Amazon called the uh, Munukruku. Uh, and this is a tribe that uh, doesn't have numbers. They really don't count. They can count up to four, but it's like one, two, three, four, many. And uh, he had to do this experiment where the, he had them, uh, had dots on a computer screen from one to ten dots. This, it took me half an hour to draw this slide. I couldn't draw <laughs> ten, ten dots. But it gives you the idea. Uh, they, the, closer, the lower the numbers, the further apart the dots are. So if they're counting, they're grouping something. It's like one would be here, two, three, and when you get to nine and ten, they're very close together. So this is something like a, a logarithmic or a hyperbolic scale. And interestingly, so if you had any of us do it, we, they gave us 10 numbers and say space them on the line, we would space them evenly. Now, school, preschool children all over the world do it like this tribe do. Okay, they, they express it sort of a hyperbolically. Uh, so that it seems to be some natural way of thinking that we kind of repress when we go to uh, school. Okay, if you think about ratios, uh, there's an... Uh, uh, there's this uh, person, uh, Macomb, who did the, she did these experiments with lions uh, walking along a path in the, in the Serengeti. And so uh, if you, she had like two lions would walk along, she would play a recording of three lions roaring, and the two lions would walk past quickly. If, she, if there were five lions, and she played a recording of uh, four lions walking, then the five lions would attack the other four and try to drive them out of the territory. So you can sort of see, thinking in terms of ratios, making quick decisions uh, instantaneously probably had an important uh, survival uh, property. Uh, yeah, so this, again, from here we move from individual discounting into this idea of social discounting in the social brain. And these are two uh, neuroscientists, again, who are involved in this project. Uh, one thing that's coming out of these studies is something called brain plasticity. Uh, the human brain is really organized to make decisions in a social context. And it's really hardwired after birth, depending on the particular culture uh, children are raised in. Uh, this other thing, these are, uh, von, John von uh, Allman has sort of rediscovered these. These are von Economo neurons, that's the guy that discovered them about 100 years ago. But they're almost unique to humans, and they, they give us the ability to quickly assess ourselves in a social uh, situation. 
So we walk into a room full of strange people. We can, these neurons are called spindle neurons because they're very thin and make, uh, send rapid impulses. Uh, so our whole decision-making process, the, the, sort of the point of this is social. So uh, this is, again, the basic economic model is an isolated individual, self-referential, and so on. So all this stuff, I think, is giving a, a smoking gun. So how can we move from the, the point of this from an individual discount rate to a truly social discount rate? How can we get back to some sort of a collective uh, decision making? So again, uh, in terms of discounting, uh, uh, so discounting is cost benefit analysis in general works very best, I think, for local projects. You can have local projects with uh, you know limited in space, limited in time. Uh, this is when discounting is most appropriate. The further we go out, uh, we get to such global issues like climate change, uh, the less appropriate it is. Okay, I'll, I'll sort of end with this, I think. And uh, this is, uh, I try to show this slide when I give it any lecture, no matter what it's about. But it's, it's absolutely astonishing. Uh, this, this green is CO2 levels, the, the blue is temperature. And for the last, you can take this has been taken back for about a million years and probably three million years. But uh, for most of uh, all, all the time humans have been on Earth, CO2 levels have varied between 200 and 280, so about 40 parts per million on either side of 240. This leap to almost 400 parts per million, that whole thing has taken place within my lifetime since 1950 or so. It's just astonishing. I mean, it's just a. I mean, what an amazing time to be alive if you look at it one way, just consider this. But uh, I just think, uh, you know, every politician, every world leader should be made to look at this thing for about an hour every day. Uh, and another interesting thing, see this, this is the Holocene. You see the extreme climate, climate stability in this period compared with the extreme un instability, the instability of the later period. This is really what made agriculture possible. I mean, humans knew about agriculture climate, year-to-year -year climate was just too, uh, too variable. And this is what we're screwing around with. I mean, it's like some of my famous climate scientists said, the climate is an angry beast and we're poking it with a stick. Okay, so the last thing is going from uh, social discounting to, uh, you know, is social discounting enough? And I've been working a lot with ant uh, biologists. And when agriculture happened, humans made the leap to something called eusociology. We, their whole society became a superorganism, like a bee, beehive or, uh, or ant society. So, uh, and these species really dominate the planet. If you look at the ants in a rainforest, for example, when they become eusocial, you have a population explosion, they totally dominate the ecosystem, resource exploitation becomes uh, really the, the, the guiding principle. Uh, the whole ecosystems of which they are part, uh, everything becomes uh, sort of harnessed in order to increase the production of, of their agriculture surplus. That should sound familiar. So, uh, yeah, so same thing happened with human agriculture. So, anyway, what's the, the implications of this for discounting? I think there are two major things. Okay, first of all, uh, if human society is a superorganism, then, then there really is no such thing as a generation concept of generation, overlapping generations, even as an individual concept. Uh, so, uh, so there's really, there's no, the discounting really becomes kind of a meaningless thing because it's an individual and a point in time thing. The other uh, thing is sort of the dark side of this. Uh, species population increases, but individuals uh, are expendable. So how can we get control of this new social system? Again, the environmental and social problems we face are clear, becoming clearer. The solutions are almost as clear, but uh, why isn't anything making a difference? I think this is uh, what's uh, troubling most of us. So anyway, <coughs> I'm going to have that. <laughs> okay. <laughs>